Thank you, sir. Good morning. I thank Dr. Chellam and the organizers for this opportunity. We'll discuss about management of valve surgery during pregnancy. It's not just about valve surgery. Uh, objectives will be under these headings. So effects of stenotic and regurgitant lesions on pregnancy, pre-pregnancy counseling, indications and timing of valve surgery, anticoagulation during pregnancy, mid-trimester PTMC and valve surgery, fetal and uh, maternal monitoring, post-operative care, that is post-valve surgery pregnant patient and combined valve surgery and caesarean section. When Jayadeva Hospital was in Victoria Hospital complex, we used to attend cath labs for emergency PTMC when patients were brought from Vani Villas Hospital in first stage of labor with pulmonary edema. And some of the patients, uh, two or three cases we had where they suddenly had uh, cardiac tamponade due to tear. And the tear used to occur at IVC RA junction. It was in the beginning stage of uh, PTMC for cardiologists also. And during those days, we used to concentrate on resuscitating the mother. And the surgeon would come to repair the defect and they would do thoracotomy. And later, surgeons would not be aware of uh, mother's status, whether she was pregnant or not. So we used to put a lead sheet and the uh, whole body was covered. So while resuscitating, the surgeon would later say, if you had told me earlier, we would have at least saved the baby. So that was the situation earlier. Fortunately, we don't have such emergencies. But still, we do get some patients who are pregnant and develop some complications during PTMC, and they come for valve surgery. Now, four minutes of uh, resuscitation for mother is a myth. This is a recent uh, uh, article in intensive care medicine where they say you have 16 minutes for advanced cardiac life support. You can uh, reduce the mortality. You save the baby as well as try to, uh, uh, try to save both mother and child. Most important thing for us to remember is we have to maintain left uterine displacement to re prevent aortic cable compression. Resuscitative hysterotomy, it is called. No, no, no more called as uh, perimortem uh, caesarean section. It relieves aortic cable compressions and improves the venous return. It improves pulmonary mechanics. Once we remove the uh, placenta and the baby, the mother's breathing patterns improve and reduces oxygen demand as the demand for the child is not required anymore. So we have to have a code for this. We need a neonatal MD, neonatal nurses, obstetricians, and respiratory therapists for uh, recitation of mother as well as the baby. We'll go to physiology. Heart disease during pregnancy is the most common cause of non-obstetric maternal mortality. Patients with VHD have a higher mortality compared to congenital heart disease. Incidence is most common mitral stenosis or regurgitation, 63%. Aortic valve disease is around 23%. Anesthetic management demands knowledge of the changes during pregnancy and their impact on heart disease and fetal well-being. So we have to remember that the cardiac output increases and SVR reduces and mean arterial pressure remains almost normal, but the changes are maximum during the stage of labor. WHO has classification for maternal uh, heart disease during pregnancy into four uh, classes. Class one is mild, where either repaired ASD, VSD, or mitral valve prolapse cases are there. This has a low risk, and uh, cardiology consultation is required once or uh, two times during pregnancy. WHO class two is unrepaired ASD, VSD, or uh, other uh, uncorrected, uh, sorry, tetralogy, which is repaired, and any arrhythmias. Class three is patients with mechanical valves, systemic uh, right ventricle, and uh, unrepaired tetralogy may be uh, tetralogy repaired is class 2, unrepaired is class 3. And uh, these patients require monthly or bi-monthly cardiac and obstetric monitoring. 
and class 4 is high risk pregnancy is contraindicated here and uh, these are severe mitral stenosis severe symptomatic aortic stenosis pulmonary hypertension left ventricular dysfunction or nyha class 3 or 4 patients so in the algorithm for preconception counseling so we will concentrate on uh, severe VHD. Surgical management prior to correction is advised. Attention to desire for valve repair or valvuloplasty instead of valve replacement. Risk and benefit of prosthetic valves, different valves we have to discuss. This has to be done in consultation with the cardiologist, cardiac surgeon and the patient. So this should be scheduled every month in women with mild disease and every two weeks in women with moderate or severe disease until 28 to 30 weeks and weekly thereafter. Smallest therapeutic doses of drugs known to be safe for fetus should be used. And we have to remember that there are some normal physiological changes which may mimic heart disease during pregnancy. These are fatigue. Decreased exercise capacity, shortness of breath, palpitation, lightheadedness, even syncope. On examination, there may be raised JVP, leg edema, palpable ventricular heave, and a systolic murmur. In general, during delivery, the timing and mode of delivery is to be decided by obstetrician, cardiologist, and anesthetist combined. Then, uh, in most of the cases, uh, normal delivery is safe. Caesarean section is reserved for obstetric indications or in an occasional patient with cardiac instability. During uh, labor, hemodynamic monitoring is recommended in symptomatic patients, in patients with moderate or severe valvular stenosis, left ventricular dysfunction, and pH. Immediately after delivery, hemodynamic changes can lead to heart failure, the mechanisms are increased venous return to the heart caused by blood shift from empty uterus into the systemic circulation. So we can advise obstetricians to clamp the umbilical cord after a minute, then decrease cable compression, mobilization of fluid from limbs and lower body. We, patients require continued hemodynamic monitoring for 12 to 24 hours after delivery. We'll see the individual lesions. Mitral stenosis is the most common valvular heart disease and most commonly caused by rheumatic heart disease. The pressure gradient across the narrowed mitral valve may greatly increase during pregnancy. So patients may become symptomatic with dyspnea, decreased exercise capacity, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, pulmonary edema. Increased left atrial pressure can also result in atrial arrhythmias. There is more than two-thirds of the patient uh, demonstrating clinical deterioration during pregnancy with development of heart failure or arrhythmias, which can lead to the need for starting or increasing a dose of cardiac medications and need for hospitalization. So main complications are pulmonary edema and thromboembolism. First episode of pulmonary edema in 60% uh, occurs at 30 weeks and 20% in the setting of atrial tachyarrhythmias. Uh, anticoagulation prophylaxis may be required in severe MS and AF even without LA clot. So management, so pre-pregnancy, those who desire to become pregnant, if they have severe MS, PTMC is advised. Moderate MS, the decision will be based on the mitral valve area, symptoms and exercise tolerance. <coughs> Whereas medical therapy during pregnancy is preferred to valve replacement before pregnancy in these patients. Mild MS, valve repair is not indicated before, before pregnancy. Those who are already pregnant, the goals are to reduce the heart rate and left atrial pressure. Heart rate can be reduced by restricting physical activity and administering beta adrenergic blockers. Use of beta blockers with beta 1 selectivity is preferred and metoprolol is preferred over atenolol. If they have AF, digoxin may be used. LA pressure can be reduced by restricting salt intake and by use of oral diuretics. But remember, aggressive use of diuretics is avoided to prevent hypovolemia and the reduction of uteroplacental perfusion. 
Use of tocolytic agents with beta mimetic effect is contraindicated in the patients with MS because of their strong chronotropic effect before delivery. Magnesium sulfate is preferred if it is required. During delivery, increased venous return may result in marked increase in left atrial and pulmonary pressures and can lead to development of pulmonary edema. Hemodynamic monitoring should continue for 12 to 24 hours. PTMC is indicated at, uh, for uh, NYHA class 3 for patients who do not respond to medical management. Complications can occur like cardiac tamponade, excessive blood loss, transient atrial fibrillation, worsening of MR, systemic embolization, uterine contractions, and precipitous labor. Exposure of uh, fetus to radiation is another problem during PTMC. This can be reduced by minimizing fluoroscopy, putting a lead sheet, and by using echocardiography and Doppler to obtain information of cardiac function and degree of MR. Despite a significant hemodynamic and symptomatic improvement, performance of PTMC at second or third trimester of pregnancy may not prevent prematurity. So indications for mitral valve surgery during pregnancy are only for severe MS patients who are refractory to optimal medical therapy, are not suitable for PTMC, or in cases where close follow-up during pregnancy is not possible. Combined valve surgery and LSCS is once MS progresses to cardiac decompensation and presents with heart failure, catheter-based therapy or valve replacement should be considered as life-saving procedure. This is a case report from our uh, hospital. Uh, two uh, mothers underwent emergency mitral valve replacement and cesarean section because of uh, uh, acute MR precipitated by AML tear during PTMC. Both babies had APCA score of 3 and were ventilated for 12 to 24 hours and uh, they reversed with naloxone and went extubated later. Mothers received IV oxytocin and uh, prostatin to prevent uterine atony after uh, delivery. This is a representation of acute MR which appears after PTMC. It's usually tear in the anterior mitral leaflet. You can see a gap here and the mitral valve opening is here which is still narrow after PTMC. There is biventricular dysfunction as well as right ventricular dilatation which is uh, due to acute MR, which is not tolerated uh, in this setting. This is another view to show the acute MR. The tear usually occurs in the anterior mitral leaflet, which is a large leaflet. This is an eccentric jet, so there will be a severe MR and they develop tachycardia. You can see the left to right shunt across the atrial septum through which they would have uh, done uh, mitral valvotomy. This helps to relieve the LA pressure and uh, you can also see there is severe TR in this patient uh, because of acute uh, pulmonary edema and hypertension. Now second lesion is mitral regurgitation. There is no need to do prophylactic mitral valve replacement in these patients. In an asymptomatic patient, no therapy is required. If patient has congestive heart failure, diuretics, digoxin may be used, nitrates and hydrolysine to uh, have vasodilatation, but no AC inhibitors, which are not safe during pregnancy. In severe symptomatic patient, MVR may be required. In aortic stenosis, Mild and moderate AS, most patients have a favorable outcome, but severe AS may result in hemodynamic and symptomatic deterioration with development of heart failure, leading to hospitalization and premature delivery. So when valve area is more than one, they tolerate it well. In severe AS, uh, there is a high maternal morbidity and unfavorable fetal outcome. So these patients should ideally undergo either balloon valvuloplasty or valve replacement before pregnancy. So medical management is with diuretics, whereas when patients develop severe symptoms during pregnancy and are resistant, 
they require early termination of pregnancy or repair of the valve either by percutaneous route or by surgery. So one important thing to remember in aortic stenosis is regional anesthesia for labor analgesia should be used with caution as to prevent decrease in SVR, which is very poorly tolerated. And general anesthesia is a choice for cesarean section in patients with AS. Aortic regurgitation without left ventricular function is usually well tolerated. In cases of severe symptomatic AR and left ventricular dysfunction, medical therapy can include salt restriction, diuretics, and digoxin. Vasodilators are hydrolysine and nitrates. And surgery, if indicated, should be delayed if possible until after delivery to avoid high risk for fatal loss. Pulmonary stenosis, in contrast to MS and AS, is tolerated better. Balloon valvuloplasty is only for a pre-pregnant patient when gradient is more than 50 across the pulmonary valve. And normal delivery is tolerated well. Now, management of pregnant patients with prosthetic valves. The concerns are increased incidence of thromboembolic events. Therapeutic anticoagulation throughout pregnancy is essential. The complications can occur still valve thrombosis, bleeding due to anticoagulation in mechanical valve or structural valve failure with bioprosthetic valves, endocarditis. Patients with ventricular or valve dysfunctions are at a high risk for heart failure or arrhythmias. Factors that increase thromboembolism are history of prior thromboembolic event, atrial fibrillation, processes in mitral position, and multiple prosthetic valves. Risk of pregnancy-specific bleeding related to placenta or delivery are increased antipartum hemorrhage, unexplained or due to placenta previa or abruption, and uh, post-delivery also, they are at increased risk due to delivery factors. Patients requiring uh, valve replacement, pre-pregnancy counseling is uh, done with explaining the risk of thrombus and thromboembolism with mechanical valves versus longer term risk of limited durability of repair or a bioprosthetic valve. Patients with mechanical valves attempting to conceive are advised to continue warfarin until they are pregnant because the risk of embryopathy is low in first six weeks of gestation. Patients with mechanical valve are in modified WHO class three. They have increased risk of maternal mortality or morbidity, require expert counseling and intensive cardiac and obstetric monitoring throughout pregnancy. Monthly or bi-monthly cardiology and obstetric review. Patients with bioprosthetic valve are in class two at least once in a trimester, trimester, they have to have cardiology consultation. So WHO class four includes prosthetic valve patients with severe pH or LV dysfunction, EF less than 30%. These are extremely high risk and pregnancy is contraindicated. If pregnancy occurs, termination should be discussed. If it continues, the management is as for class three patients. Anticoagulation. During first trimester, if the baseline warfarin dose is less than 5 mg per day, it may be used with close monitoring of INR to maintain INR around 2. Dose adjusted subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin from 6 to 12 weeks is an alternative for patients who wish to avoid the risk of warfarin. If low molecular weight heparin is unavailable, then uh, IV unfractionated heparin with target APTT of 2 to 2.5 con well, times the control is an option. If the warfarin dose is more than 5 mg per day, switch to dose adjusted subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin throughout first trimester. Once pregnancy is confirmed, low molecular weight heparin should be again dose uh, at twice the uh, per, at least twice per day with target anti 10 a levels of 1 to 1.2 unit per ml, which is done at uh, 6 hours after the dose. If low molecular weight heparin is available, then unfractionate heparin is advised. Whether they receive warfarin or heparin, additional low dose of aspirin is also advised. During second and tri uh, third trimester, warfarin with aspirin 
is continued till 36 weeks. The transition from warfarin to low molecular weight heparin needs to be individualized, individualized for women at high risk of preterm delivery, like in Fontan patients. If mother chooses to avoid fetal risk associated with warfarin, then low molecular weight heparin is advised. Warfarin during pregnancy requires close monitoring of INR, at least done twice weekly, and patient education regarding dietary intake of vitamin K. Planned inductions or cesarean deliveries are necessary to safely transition and manage anticoagulants. Vaginal delivery is preferred. Delivery with a prosthetic valve management in each case is individualized based on patient preference, obstetric indications, cardiologist, thrombosis expert, and anesthesiologist. Change in antithrombotic -thromb anti therapy at 36 weeks, warfarin should be switched to dose-adjusted subcutaneous uh, heparin administered at least twice per day. Dose-adjusted continuous inf infusion of unfractionated heparin is offered if uh, low molecular weight is not available. So, cessation of low as dose aspirin is done to a week before delivery. Uh, planned uh, women treated with uh, low molecular weight heparin should be switched to unfractionated heparin. Last dose is administered 24 hours before planned induction. 12 hours later, uh, unfractionated heparin is uh, commenced at 1000 to 1250 units per hour. No loading dose is required. Infusion rate adjusted at six hourly intervals to achieve APTT, twice the control. Timing of cessation of uh, unfractionated heparin may be difficult. So it is uh, usually done once uh, she's in established labor. So for cesarean section, four to six hours before it should be stopped. Urgent delivery, the goal is balancing the risk of life-threatening maternal hemorrhage against catastrophic risk of thromboembolism or valve thrombosis or uh, fatal consequences of not performing urgent delivery. If the woman is, in on, is on warfarin, reversal with vitamin K is appropriate to protect the fetus from hemorrhage. Full reversal is required in life-threatening maternal hemorrhage also. <clears throat> Caesarean section is favored to reduce the risk of fatal trauma and hemorrhage in these patients. Stop warfarin, give uh, factor 4 concentrate with a target INR of 2. If no PCC is available, FFP may be used at 15 to 20, 30 ml per kg. Small dose of uh, IV vitamin K will reverse maternal INR in 6 hours or more, but fetal INR may not be fully reversed. Protamin should be given for low molecular weight heparin and uh, for unfractionated heparin. Usually anticoagulation is uh, reversed on its own. And post delivery, after four to six hours, unfractionated heparin should be started. And uh, warfarin is delayed for one or two days if there are no hemorrhagic, if there are hemorrhagic complications after cesarean delivery. Now, fetal monitoring, uh, the goal is to maintain heart rate between 110 to 160 beats per minute. So, it's important for perfusionists to maintain the flow rates, mean arterial pressure and maternal temperature. It can be intermittently done for fetuses of less than 30, 24 weeks, but uh, continuously done for uh, more than 24 weeks of gestation and continued for 12 to 24 hours after delivery. It is done with the cardio tachometer, fetal echocardiography, or Doppler transducers. Now, bradycardia is the most frequent fetal response to CPB and is reversible by increasing perfusion. And causes of fetoplacental dysfunction, fetal hypoxia, hypothermia at the onset of CPB, and drugs that cause placental barrier, such as beta blockers and narcotics. Factors that reduce placental circulation and lead to fetal hypoxia are uterine, AV shunting, obstruction of venous drainage by AVC cannula, particulate or gaseous emboli, uterine atony. <coughs> These may be observed when maternal circulation and uh, perfusion are adequate also. It may be related to narcotics. Reasons for fetal hypoxia, asphyxia are... Uh, Reduce maternal SVR, low uterine blood flow, hemodilation, hypothermia, prolonged CPB, or maternal narcotics. 
uterine contractions are frequent during cpb most important predictor this is the most important predictor of uh, fetal death more common during rewarming phase and uh, with increasing gestational age these are more frequent cpb related hemodilution decreases the progesterone hormonal levels increasing uterine excitability uteroplacental hypoperfusion can precipitate uterine contractions and these contraction may occur even after completion of cpb monitoring is required for early Id identification of contractions they may cause placental insufficiency secondary fetal hypoxia during cpb so the goal is to maintain mean arterial pressure above 70 but when uterine contractions occur higher mean arterial pressures are required tocolytic therapy is with beta agonist magnesium progesterone supplementation but beta agonist may increase oxygen demand and myocardial work while surgery during pregnancy we have to remember a few points uh, the main goal is to sustain adequate fetal maternal gas exchange and uh, use of normothermic mild hypothermic perfusion is advised maintaining pump flow rate more than 2.5 liter per minute per square meter and mean arterial pressure above 70 minimum hemodilution high pao2 use of membrane oxygenator alpha stat using pulsatile flow they have used iabp for maintaining this Beating heart surgery is particularly desirable, but most of the valve surgeries require cardioplegia. So potassium levels have to be monitored and glucose has to be maintained adequately. Anesthesia goals are maintaining uh, cardiac output with rate, rhythm, contractility, avoiding myocardial depression and maintaining preload SVR. Uterus should be displaced leftward to minimize effect of cable compression. And the, but small increases in vascular volume may produce dramatic increase in filling pressure resulting in pulmonary edema. So any drug may be used, even narcotics have been used in spite of fatal depression. Remifentanil appears to be an ideal agent. Thank you.